Yes, yeah, so as, as Seamus said, I, I grew up in New Jersey, and um, you know, when, when I, I've, I've given talks before on, on entrepreneurship and kind of what put me on this path to decide to do something crazy, like start my own business and quit a perfectly good job and um, um, go down a path that's very risky. You know, the vast majority of startups fail. You know, something like 99% of them don't make it. You know, so it's a, it, in, in some cases, it's an it's exciting concept, it's an exciting thought, um, but there's a, there's a lot of stress and a lot of other things involved in it. But you know, I, I think back to um, my childhood and, and thinking about relatives and parents and, and all the people that influence you in life. And um, my father, my mother, my grandparents, they were all in business for themselves. They all had something going on. My grandpa was an insurance salesman. He had his own insurance business. My other grandpa was a farmer. Uh, my great-grandmother worked for my grandfather. He, she was his uh, controller and, and financial person. Um, they were all very active, and, and the question to me when I, when I got out of college and was starting to think about what I want to do, it wasn't, well, where are you going to go work? Who are you going to go work for? It was, what are you going to do? You know, and that's an important difference. In, in the approach, and, and I said, well, you know, I want to go build cool things. I want to go do things like that, and I ended up working for somebody, you know? And this is my family. It's like, what, what, he's working for someone? What is this? You know, you don't work for someone in this family. And that was, that was a little bit of a, of a shock, and, and I, I, I felt, though, that I needed to learn, and I needed to learn about business, and um, needed to do that in agriculture, kind of away from New Jersey. I decided, um, you know, came out here for a PhD and stayed. Really didn't want to go back there. I'd go back there for Christmas or the holidays, and it was just too busy and too much traffic and um, all the things that you don't even consider in your life here about, oh, you know, and, and I know some Champagne natives will complain about the traffic. Oh, it took me five minutes to get across town. Yeah, this isn't traffic, you know. Tra traffic is where you have to plan your life around something. When you go, oh, I gotta go run to Lowe's and go get a new light switch, and you go, oh, I can't do it now. I'll go at 11 o'clock tonight because it'll only take me a half hour to get there as opposed to an hour and a half, you know? So we're, we're, we're blessed in that sense in this community. Um, but I, I decided to stay um, here and, and, and go down that path. I, I went into a consulting business, and I was in that for 12 years and learned a lot about the consulting world and, and what that means. And for those that, um, probably the, the easiest example of a consulting business is a lawyer. And if you've ever had to work with a lawyer, you go into their office, they charge you per hour for what they're doing, um, they have expertise, they give you what you need, that's getting out of jail, getting out of a speeding ticket, <laughs> you know, whatever it is, finding your birth certificate, there are all sorts of things that a lawyer can help you with. Well, in consulting, I was doing the same sort of thing, but for businesses. I was working with major ag chem companies and US EPA trying to re-register pesticides safely across the country. Um, so I learned all about US agriculture. So I grew up in New Jersey. My grandpa was a potato farmer. I learned about that agriculture came out to University of Illinois, I learned a lot about the corn and soybean rotations that are out here. But then in that consulting career, I learned about rice and cotton and sugar beets, tomatoes, sugar cane in Florida and, uh, and um, other areas of Texas, and all the other vegetable production, the amazing vegetable production. Did you know that 80%, almost 85% now of the vegetables that we consume in the US are produced in California? You know, and three cycles per year, three, three uh, in rotation, you know, um, three crops a year coming out of the, those fields. So anyway, I, I, I kind of left that consulting career and, and here started Agrable, and, and that's, that's kind of that crazy step of, okay, I'm on this relatively safe path. I've moved to Champaign, Illinois, and I'm, I'm built up this consulting business here in town, um, partnered with a group that was in Virginia. Um, great paying job nice house, cars, everything, and then said, nah, you know, this is not for me. I, I need to make a change. And to, to, to do that in life, I mean, I'm, I'm 40 years old, not, not young or old, um, but to decide with the family and all of the risk that that takes to say, no, it's time for a change, it's time to do something, that's that entrepreneurial spirit that we talk about. You know, and and I, I wanted to just go to the next slide here real quick and, and talk about, you know, what is entrepreneurship? I mean, first of all, it's a word that almost no one can spell. You know? <laughs> I, 
I, che I know everyone, if you tried to type it, it's been wrong, and spell check, thankfully, helps us with, with entrepreneur. But what does, what does it really mean to be an entrepreneur? Um, I think that really comes down to an understanding and an acceptance of the risks, the rewards, and the challenges. So, I mean, what are, what are the risks? The risks are I walked away from a perfectly good career, and I'm going after something that I'm passionate about, that I believe in, um, and, and building a company around. <coughs> Well, why would I do that? Well, the, the rewards are there in, in particular. You know, the rewards both um, technically, um, in terms of what I can try to accomplish or where I can, where I can move my mind to. Um, there's also financial rewards. You know, if, 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 if these things come together, you've started something amazing. And, uh, you know, there's these sayings that, you know, entrepreneurship or the definition of it is work like no one would for a few years so that you never have to work like everyone else has to for the rest of their lives. You know, that's, that's the dream. Right? Um, now, as I, I preface that, the vast majority of, of startups and businesses fail somewhere in that system. Um, but you look to some of the success stories and the people, you know, what, um, think of the Wendy's founder, Dave Thomas. The stories of that being his seventh or eighth restaurant that he started was Wendy's, you know, and the number of failures before. So much of this is a learning process, too, and, and once you get into it, you learn so much, um, and those are the challenges. But really what I want to make a plea for in terms of entrepreneurship is, is creating an ecosystem. And, you know, I think Champaign is a wonderful place. I'm a big advocate for this town, um, particularly in agriculture, um, for a business like we have. It's a great town surrounded by agriculture. There's an opportunity for so much here, affordable housing, um, great universities, great schools here to help um, nurture and, and, um, and plan. We really need to make a focus in Champaign in, in entrepreneurship, and we've, we've, we have such opportunity here. Um, what it requires are, are more crazy people like me um, to, really, to really take that plunge and try to be um, creative, creative in terms of building a company. I mean, to, to give you a feel for Agrable, and I'll go to the, the next slide here. You know, what, what are we? We're, we're 60 people. So to put that in context, two years ago, this business didn't exist. And now it employs 60 people. You know? And these are 60 high-paying jobs. These are experts in their fields. They're um, full-time professionals. You know, this is quite a quite a feat to pull that off, to think about going from almost no, nowhere. And it, there's some interesting social issues. And you know, one, one of the things that you, um, you think about in a business that's been around for 20 or 30 years, there's the guy who's been there and done it. Oh, you don't know anything, Sonny. You know, 10 years ago, this and this happened in this business. Well, I have people in the business who are across their careers, you know, those who have retired and are looking for something else to do part time from those just graduating from school. And everyone has been there for less than a year. Think about what that means you know, to that culture and trying to build that culture. That's so different from other areas. And that's what's, I think, unique about startups and the startup environment and maybe what's alluring for, to, to many about that as well. It is truly um, a mix of people all very new into a career at a certain place with a lot of excitement, a lot of energy, and a lot of focus. All right, so what are we trying to do overall with Agrable? We're trying to leverage science and analytics to impact a farmer's crops and operations during the growing season. So that's what this group of 60 people are doing. That's the idea behind this. And, and we're pulling that together into, uh, into tools and, and software. And that software has a, a very simple name here. It's called Morning Farm Report. And it's, uh, it's exactly what it is. It's a report about your farm in the morning. You know? And that's key. You know, I, 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 some of the names of startups out there, and you know, even ours, Agrable, what does that mean? People ask us, what's, what's Agrable? Well, we needed a web address that wasn't something else. And, you know, it's like, well, everything's taken. You go, any two words in the English dictionary strung together, someone already has that. You, know? you have to come up with a word for, your, for the title of your company. But we actually got Morning Farm Report. String three words together, and you can actually find the, uh, the web address, believe it or not. Um, so, morning farm report, report about your farm in the morning. We send an email to growers at 5 a.m., and then we have a software website where you can go and interact with a whole bunch of tools, and I'll show you what some of those are. But first, I want to talk a little bit about the customers. So, this is the reach. This is the range. Of course, the United States, every little purple dot is someone who's used one of our products in one way or another. Um, 
we started a year ago really focused on corn and soybean agriculture. So we have that great density right there where corn and soybean are grown, it's in the Midwest. Um, and then a number of uses in, in all 50 states. And I, I think a bunch of people in Canada try to use it, but it just doesn't work there. So, um, but that's, that's the, initially the software footprint of, of where we're out selling our products and, and working with people and, and trying to help them in their, in their operations. So the way we sell software um, are through these things called agribundles. And agribundles are groupings of software pieces for different purposes, for different grower groups, for different grower types. Um, you can imagine if you're in corn and soybean agriculture in the Midwest here in Illinois, there's not a lot of irrigation here. So irrigation in an Illinois grower might not be an important feature, but someone in Texas, someone in Nebraska, that's essential. And without irrigation, they wouldn't even consider buying the software from you. So we bundle things up regionally into different groups. We go and sell direct to growers. We bundle it up into um, packages for land managers, for retailers. And you're able to then kind of pull um, across a vertical within an industry. So we're not just selling directly to one group, we're selling to many people in that. And there's a social aspect to the software too, where they can get in and use it and share different pieces with trusted advisors and create that digital community that's essential to information sharing and that power of, of harnessing information. So to kind of get specific in terms of what this software does and why we have this group of people who are madly typing away at the keyboards. And I was talking to Seamus before about uh, Kind of, he, he's seen our office and we're over on the research park at University of Illinois and it's, it's one large open floor plan office. And um, I was worried about that at first. I thought, boy, it's gonna be noisy in here. You know, 50, 60 people sitting in there and um, it's not. You know, when, when we think about the majority in this next generation of, of how people interact, there's instant messaging programs and text messages. And I, I, I laugh because there'll be days I'm, I'm sitting there and all of a sudden half the office stands up and walks out the door and no one said a word. Like, What's going on? What just happened? And it's, oh, they all decided to go to lunch together. <laughs> you know? And not a word was spoken. So it, you know, it's, this, it's this room full of people all working in one direction, um, building the software, and this is the step one of it. Um, up in the upper left-hand corner there, I have a field boundary. So when we're working with a grower, the key information first is you have to know where their field is. And once you know where their field is, then you know about the soils, you know about the history of the crop rotation, you know about the weather patterns and the weather forecast of what's gonna happen on that field. And you place that all into an agricultural context and you can then advise a grower. This goes into a system we call field story. It's the story of your field. It runs down fertilizer applications, chemical applications, yield observations, um, tillage operations. Everything that you're doing on a field is recorded there um, for, for use and incorporation to the other tools. To, um, I think this example, I, I, I use this often because it's, um, it's a very easy product to explain and, and you can see how tangibly this kind of information can be pulled together and help a grower. In the um, backdrop image here, that's Champaign, Vermilion County, and two counties to the south. All of the green fields are fields on the particular day that this slide was made where um, a particular farmer could actually go and work. Where they're red and yellow, the soil conditions are such that if they drove the tractor in that field, they would likely make a mess or cause compaction or really tear up the fields or um, you know, bury the tractor in the fields in some cases, like those red fields. I mean, that's the sort of thing. So there's a zoom in window showing you the detail. So this is field by field information. Every field in the country, we're able to go in and that's that big data, you know, everybody talks about big data. This is, this is what we mean by big data. We have information on every single field, all the soil types, all the weather that's going on. And once a user intersects that information with where they care about, right, and that would be the fields here that are highlighted, we're able to go in and then use and link that forecast technology together to look at a calendar view. And that's what's in the upper right here is a calendar view that shows today, the next week, 14 days out of what's particularly going to happen in that field and uh, then from that, you're able to plan your operations. You know, should I, just because it's yellow and red here in this area, can I go there tomorrow? Can I go there the next day? So we're taking that information that, that used to be in a farmer's mind. Um, rainfall, right? It, it's rained an inch on my field. Well, what, what does that mean to me? They, 
Growers have an innate sense of, of what an inch of rainfall means. Well, if, if I got that inch of rainfall yesterday and I try to go in that field, it's going to make a mess. You know, that's, that's an easy one. Most of us could figure that out. If it rains an inch, it's going to be muddy out, you know, and your kids are going to go get mud on their shoes. Everything crazy is going to happen, right? But what if it was a quarter inch of rain? You know, a quarter inch of rain when there was nothing planted, a quarter inch of rain when the corn was this tall. What's that do? And I still drive in the field on that day. So that's the complexity here that we're pulling in. It's all of those little pieces and components of the agriculture tied in with the weather to give advice on can you drive in a field and when are you going to get stuck and when are you going to make a mess in a field as an example. We take it a step further into yield estimation. And these are some graphics that show a soybean field, the fertilization plan for that field. So this gets very, very technical and very drilled down into the day-to-day -day desires of what that grower is thinking about. Do they need to apply a nitrogen fertilizer? Is it running off? Do they have enough? Are they going to maximize their yield potential in that year? Farming is one of the most risky industries. You're, you're taking out, let me give you the example of a typical 1,000, 2,000 acre grower in this area. Right at the beginning of the year, they'll take out a loan for somewhere between one and $1.5 million from the bank. So imagine that now. They're going to go out and buy seed, they're going to buy fertilizer, they're going to throw it out in a field, and they're going to hope, cross their fingers, that it's going to rain and that everything else is going to happen, and they're going to get enough return that the price is going to be stable enough in terms of the return that they can not only get that money back, but eke a profit out of that. It's a hugely intensive business. Now, when, 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 in terms of inputs, their, their profit potential is maybe $100,000, maybe $200,000 that they could earn out of a business of that scale in a typical year. So their costs are enormous. They're betting the farm every year, you know. Um, we're trying to help them with information in advance as possible with the weather forecast and others to try to help them understand and maximize both the potential profit and then knowing when to stop, too. Consider this. You're headed into a drought. All right. You don't know you're headed into a drought, but the weather forecasts are all predicting that. What does that mean? What choices might you make? Now, there's crop insurance against a complete disaster, but a grower might decide, you know, I'm not going to put down that extra nitrogen. All these reports are saying that I'm headed towards drought. That nitrogen isn't going to increase the yield. The drought is going to kill the crop. I shouldn't spend that money, right? They just keep it in the bank. Even though they, they took it as a loan, they're having to repay it, but if they don't spend it, it's not money lost. So there, there are a number of business decisions happening throughout the year um, that we're able to help with. And this is an example of the yield engine where you're estimating the yield, which gives them an understanding of their profit and then the nutrient piece about the biggest input. 80 to 90% of the cost going into ground is, is in some cases fertilizer, depending on the crop. We also do something called find my seed. So um, find my seed helps a grower find their best hybrid, the best hybrid or plant that they're about to plant. Um, we work hard on these user interfaces to make them clean looking and easy to understand. And they give you know, great results here in terms of independently looking across all the possible seeds. This is another example of big data and of pulling big data together. We have 200,000 independent trials. And of those 200,000 independent trials, this example shows 72,000 different choices for a grower in terms of what they're going to plant. And they're able to come down here and pick, well, for my field, what are the top five varieties that would work well? And then from that top five, which ones may I, um, may I pick? And I, I think the reason and some of the genesis and the thought behind this particular tool, I, I got this, this bug in my mind. I, I wanted to have my own chickens. You know, I wanted some eggs around my house. And my, my wife thought it was really funny. So she got me a subscription to um, poultry, Farmer magazine and yeah, you, you name it. There's like four or five poultry magazines that come out. As a joke, she got me these magazines. And, but I, I really dug into it and I was looking. I, I wanted chickens. I wanted to figure it out. And I got this chicken selection guide that comes. And it had, I don't know, 30, 40,000 varieties of chicken. And you can mail order chickens. I had no idea this is possible. I mean, I'm a kid from New Jersey. You know, I'm out here and, and I'm, wow, you know, look at all these chicken choices. But then you look in the magazine and there's, there's five characteristics, you know, hardiness, Winter tolerant, good egg layer, good meat producer. There's like five things. You got 20,000 choices with five, five possible pieces of information. 
I was paralyzed. I couldn't figure out what chicken to pick. I, and I, I stopped right there and I was done. That was my experiment, the chicken. Never even got the chickens. And I, I imagine that's how a farmer feels when you're thinking about seeds and you're thinking about corn and soybean variety selections. You know, do I go with what my seed uh, salesman says? In a lot of cases, they do. They have a long-term relationship with that seed salesperson. Um, this is another way. It's another way to start to evaluate what have other growers done in your area? What have other companies shown success with and maybe um, select a different choice? So again, we're trying to work with that grower to help them on their major input decisions. How can we help them uh, make a better choice? And that's the whole point of the software. Here's another example of, of how we're, we're helping a grower with um, information. And um, here's, an, you know, this is of course Virginia, North Carolina. And I, ha I use this example because it's the middle of the winter here and there hasn't really been hail in Illinois yet. As soon as there's hail here, we'll pull up an Illinois map. But for now, this was a hailstorm that happened about a month ago in North Carolina. The purple areas in the center, those are where hail was 80 to 90% likely to occur. The area is kind of in gray there where hail was somewhere between 60 and 80% likely to occur. And the yellow stars all over were actual ground observations of where people said and called up the National Weather Service and said, hail's happened here and it caused some kind of damage. So this shows the accuracy of our data, but then we're taking information like this and we are putting it field by field into um, the interface and allowing growers to then look and say and get an alert that says, hail damage has occurred on your field. It was this, this kind of damage hailstones that were golf ball sized or softball sized or thumb sized. They're able to look at what size the hail was, look at how long that hail occurred for, and then assess the damage. And then they're able to call up their crop insurance agent and say, hey, I had damage. I need to get an adjuster out here to take a look. Um, and the quicker they do that, the less money they spend on the crop, the greater the chance they, they have of a profit. We have another group within Agribull, and this is um, something that I've been thinking and, and talking about um, here with Parkland. This is uh, Agribull Services, and many of us have heard, I don't, I don't know if you're familiar, who's, who's heard of the drone kind of revolution? You know, there's millions of drones out there now. We have, we have two companies in town here, um, Habico and Horizon Hobbies. I think Horizon Hobbies, as an example, makes something like 800,000 drones a year. You know, ridiculous numbers of these things out there. Um, in agriculture, there are fewer. You know, a drone that can go out and fly a 40-acre field like I'm showing here, they're selling somewhere between $10,000 and $15,000 per drone. It's got a fancy camera on it that's in addition to red, green, blue, which is what we think of in all of our cell phone cameras, um, you know, to a, a near-infrared camera that gives us some additional information about what is the health of the field. We formed a group, Agribull Services, that goes out and actually does these flights. Um, there's a number of interesting scaling issues here about how do we equip someone with this? How do we go out and look at the weather forecast to make sure you know you can actually fly? And when should you go and what field should you pick? So we're able to use the analytic software to then drive the drones to the correct places at the correct time to make the correct observations. Otherwise, you're just out there with a cool toy. And let's take an, ex an example of a farmer who has 2,000 acres spread out across a county and a half. And they go and pay $15,000, $20,000 for a drone. And they hand it to their grandson and say, uh, you know, hey, go fly this around. He doesn't know where to go. He doesn't know which field. There's a time of day. You know, there's a window between 10 and 2 when you're supposed to fly. Um, we are able to go and look at the weather patterns of what's about to occur and uh, narrow down into a, into a fine window there of likelihood of a disease to be there. Well, if you want to take a picture of a field to then do something to fix the yield loss, you have to go somewhere where you think there might be a problem. Now, I can only go so far with the analytics. I'm not actually there. I can tell you that the likelihood is that you have a disease on a field. But until you go observe it with a drone or walk into the field or from a satellite platform, make an observation of that, of that risk, it's really not... Um, it's really not actionable. So once it becomes actionable then, the recommendation that I can make is you should go spray it. You should go spray it with a fungicide. You should spray it with an insecticide. And that, making that recommendation far enough in advance that um, 
you can act on it is, is a, huge, a huge piece. And that's what we're doing with, with Agrable Services, along with the research and development of going out and doing these flights so that we can start to understand when, um, when we need to fly and what those responses look like. Because I can understand what a disease looks like in a field. I can go up and look at gray leaf spot as a, as a problem in a field. And I can go, ah, that's gray leaf spot. But I have to teach that drone from 400 feet up through a sensor to identify gray leaf spot. There's a lot of research work that has to go on to actually pull that off. No one's done that yet. There's a lot of opportunity there. All right, so I wanted to talk a little about the big picture, and this is some cool stuff here. This is an example of um, forecast modeling, and we hired um, and merged with a number of people in Agrable to pull together this expertise and really look into um, weather forecasting. This is an example of weather forecast. We run over 100 weather forecasts a day for each location in the world. Um, black would be zero models agreeing up to this end into the purples and then ultimately to white would be 100 or more of the models agreeing. And this is a time series here, 14 days, and it shows all the models agreeing three or four days out. And we know this, right? I mean, most weather guys are right for a couple of days. You know, is it going to rain tomorrow? Is it going to rain the next day? You can figure that out, right? But once you get out three or four days, we see some divergence here where many of the models agree, but some disagree for a while, for a number of days. And that shows that something happened there, right? Something's going on. Something's occurring. A weather front maybe moved through. Maybe some of the models predict it moved through right at that time. Others predicted it moved through a day later. And that shows some, some variability. Um, here's an example of when we start to think globally, and that's another thing that Agrable does outside of just the US. Um, we work in 86 countries right now, trying to help those around the world. So you know, I started off on the first slide talking about um, feeding you know, almost 10 billion people by, by 2050. Um, the advances in agriculture that we can make in the US are just a drop in the hat in terms of ultimately the opportunity there to boost food production and double food production on that same schedule. Um, the greatest opportunities for it are globally. So this is an example here of rainfall or precipitation. And this is an animation showing over a number of hours um, cumulative precipitation and precipitation movement for Brazil. One thing to note here, it seems pretty pot-marked all over Brazil. That's the little microclimates in a country like that, so different from the US. You know, something to consider where the agriculture there and the challenges that those growers have is far different from what we have in the US. So we can spread that out and kind of look. This is a global map. We have Africa here, and I'm going to show an example of a project we're doing in Tanzania right now. Um, here, and this is the Rafiji Basin in Tanzania. So some, some of the things that we take for granted here in the US is just um, is, is, is more challenging in, in areas of, of Africa, certainly. But in Tanzania, in the Rafiji Basin, so the Rafiji is a river, and this is a river basin. This is the watershed of all water that falls in that area would drain to the river and out. This is a land use analysis. So we did this for the Tanzanian government, um, where we actually modeled crops and grew um, maize and rice and other crops here. For the expressed purpose of trying to match river flows and show them what's happening. So he, this, is, this is kind of the fun thing of what's going on here is the entire river in the Rafiji Basin is being stolen. Now think about that for a second. The entire river is stolen. There are illegal withdrawals taken from the river. People cut a channel out of the side, irrigate vast portions of, of um, agriculture. In, in, and what we're able to show is that it is agriculture. They're, they're non-documented. So in the US, we have, we have um, water, water rights and, and all sorts of laws. And they're, they're, they differ on the east side of the Mississippi and the west side of the Mississippi between who owns what and whether water flows onto your property, if you have the right to receive it, or you have the right to receive no more. There's slightly different laws in the US. Well, there are actually laws in Tanzania, and no one follows them. So what ends up happening is that the river stops flowing, because 
it's unregulated, it's uncontrolled. There, there are people doing so many illegal withdrawals from the river that there's zero flow. So we're working with the Tanzanian government to show them um, what's going on, when it's going on, and that it's absolutely tied to the way in which the agriculture crops that we can see from air photos are actually producing. Um, so this is a way for that government to then come in and start to make policy about um, ways to make a positive change there. Um, so we can take that and think about that more globally. This is a soil moisture map of the globe. So these are all of the um, kind of like the uh, brown areas, and we can tell that from Africa and the Sahara area are a deficit of soil moisture. The green areas would be a surplus. So this is the status of um, the global water footprint you know, in 2016. So we can use this sort of thought to think about, well, where, where in the world can we go to produce crops? You know, um, there's a lot of talk about China and China really not having the ability to produce the, um, the food that, that it needs. It actually does have, have a considerable resource there that's being used now more and more. And the one thing about China to think is, you know, if, if it would take 20 or 30 years in the US, it takes less than a year for them to get to that same place in China. The, the rate of growth, I, I went over there for a trip. I spoke at a number of universities there. And um, two years before I was there, there was no interstate system. I was there and they had an interstate system. Now it was exactly like the US, green signs, you know, with a little exit sign off to the left and right. I, mean, I couldn't read any of it, it was all Chinese characters. But it was exactly our interstate system plopped down in China and it took them two years to put an interstate system. We're still working on ours that started right after World War II. You know? the, the, the ability for them to, um, to produce is, is incredible. But here we see, you know, the global supply of water, where we have the ability to grow crops. And, and I, I think you really need to call attention to the US. You know, you can look north into Canada, Greenland, Siberia. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of precipitation there, but the conditions are all wrong for growing anything. You know, I guess we could wait for climate change and global warming for 50 years, and then maybe we could grow something there, but everybody would be dead by then. So, you, but you look globally, look at these green areas, look at where we can go to grow and support ourselves. Brazil, huge potential, right? We know that. But there's a lot of issues there. You're talking about deforesting rainforests, you know, to turn that land into production. The Midwest, the upper Midwest, smaller areas of Africa, you have China, and then of course, Eastern Europe and Eastern Europe with um, some really amazing opportunities for growth. The kind of three areas, and when I, when I think globally about places that look like Illinois, you know, if I blindfolded you and drugged you and threw you on an airplane and it ended up you were in Argentina or you were in Eastern Europe or you were in the US, you couldn't tell the difference. You would, I'd plop you down there and you'd say, oh, I'm in Illinois somewhere, and you'd try to find until you they were speaking another language. They, they look that much like here. You know, there's really kind of three or four key areas globally where we can grow crops. So it's about taking the technologies and thoughts that we have in the US, trying to apply that globally. And that's some of them that we're able to do. I have another mesmerizing image here of, of, uh, of China and just looking at the temperatures and some of those temperature challenges here in terms of the, uh, every kind of pulse of that purple this is cycling through, that's a day, right? That would be the high and low temperature of a day. Um, but really neat to look. And this is the level of data. When we talk about big data, this is what we mean. And you're really working with this, this, this kind of information and then drilling it down to a field by field level. And then I'm gonna end with just one slide. This is uh, another little animation. Who can tell me where this is? Anyone figure it out? It's Champaign County. And that's Champaign-Urbana right in the center. Got Rantoul up there. Um, the green is soybean. The yellow is corn. And this is flicking through five years. So it truly puts our, our little town in context here of of what we're doing and what we're doing in U.S. agriculture and how dominant it is. You know, I, I, I often think about um, 
you know, the summers here in August and, and early September and say, oh, it's so muggy, it's so hot, you know, and then the corn starts to turn yellow and senesce, you know, and all of a sudden it's like, wow, it's a beautiful fall day. And, you know, it has nothing to do with fall, it has everything to do with that corn no longer evapotranspiring all that moisture to make it hot and muggy. Our environment here is changed by the crops that we grow. Right? So if you really want to know the weather, you want to know when it's going to change and when they're going to have that great fall day, look to the crops, not to the weather guy. You know? And that's, that's the heart of what Agrable does. We, we think about the crops, we think about putting that crop into perspective. So, All right, so with that, I, I wanted to talk just for a little bit and then kind of open it up to questions and just as a starter here, thinking about entrepreneurship, any questions there, agriculture, the international aspects, questions about Agribol and how we found it, morning farm report or drones, really any, any questions that you have, I'm, I'm ready to answer and talk and have a discussion. So. If I, if, would I do it or? Um, I have one. No, I'm saying like Yeah, th that's, th you, you, you could, you know. Um, let, me, let me think about the, if you wanted to start a business to go out and fly drones, you would need a car, you would need some software, you'd need customers, and you'd need the drone to pay for it, right? But you, you ultimately start with that mix, and um, there, there is an opportunity. Right now there are some, um, some legal challenges, the FAA has come in and, and said that you, you need to, to operate as a business for profit. You need to first have an exemption from a number of rules. Uh, we think this summer that's going to change. So there might be, might be other opportunities. There's an insurance policy, insurance, can, you know, what if you fly it into somebody's car or you crash it, what, what happens then? Um, but yeah, there, there are some wonderful drones. I, I think really where I want to get to is a drone that's lower cost than that, that does a lot of this, this work. Um, Horizon Hobbies has one right now called the Chroma drone, and it's about $1,000, and it's got a HD camera on it, shoots some amazing video, um, and very easy to fly. When we talk about some of the drones that, that we're looking at, they actually take off, you, you manually take them off and get them flying to about this high, then you hit a program button and off they go, and they fly themselves in a pattern across the entire field, and they stitch that imagery together to make an image for the entire field. So really neat stuff. And that technology is, you know, if, if you don't like what's out there, wait three months and, and someone will have fixed it. It's, it's rapidly changing, so. Yeah. I'm interested in your data sources. So mm -hmm. where do you get the vast collection of data that you need to, to create these services? Yeah, so the, the source data or where we get the, the basic information is all government available sources. They're free to everyone as taxpayers. So we take that information and we know how to use it. And that's really the key is, is taking the noise out of some of that data. Um, for example, the soils data set. USDA collected soils data in the 1920s, 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s. There was, I don't know, research scientists you would call them. The USDA employed thousands of them, and they walked the entire country and took soil samples of the fields. Cores, you know, putting a core in, pulling it out, analyzing that soil, and moving across a field until it changed. They built this wonderful data set that then in the 1980s and 1990s was digitized into a computerized format. Then it was cleaned and checked, and now we're able to use it. And we've spent four or five years then going in and cleaning it and checking it yet again so we can actually use it. But it ultimately started as a government, government data set. And we've added value to it so that it actually operates and completes and runs our model simulations. The same could be said for the weather models. The, we use the, the weather radars that do a wonderful job in precipitation. And um, for the hail products, we use that sort of stuff too. So at a core, it's, it's taking technology that's there, that's available to anyone, knowing how to use it properly, pulling it into a framework. What, the one thing about business, I think, in general, is that business isn't about the idea, it's about the execution. You know? So many of us could have the idea, oh, we should use radar to figure out how much it rained in that farmer's field and then give it to them. You know, okay, that's an idea that any of us could have, but to then execute on it is actually the business value, right? Figuring out how to do that, how to do it, how to deliver it, all the nuance to make that happen, that's the hard work. 
Yeah. What sort of marketing did you use to promote your company from, from nothing to where it's at today? Yeah, it's, it's, the marketing question is, is amazing. You know, it's, a, uh, it's very challenging to come from nowhere. So think about this. You know, you're, you're an unknown brand. You're selling a new product that no one's ever seen before. And you're selling it with people who haven't sold it before and that no one knows. You know, that's, a, that's an invitation for a problem, right? I mean, think about this. If, if you go down to a car dealership to buy a car, well, all right, it's a Cadillac dealership. I, I know Cadillacs. I've seen them around. I might even know the guy. And the location's been there for the last 30 years. That's where you go to buy Cadillacs. You know, this is a completely different piece, you know, and very challenging. Um, so we, we have to go out and um, first build through word of mouth, you know, hand-to-hand -hand show people what the value of the software is, get the early adopter group. Within any group, there is a group of early adopters. There's that guy who was the first person to have a flat screen TV. Who is that? You know, I have a friend who did that, paid like $14,000 for this thing, and you look at it now and you laugh at the guy because they're like 50 bucks at Walmart for the same thing. You know, but he is that guy, they're, and they're, they're, all, they're out there. Those type of people are out there, and you have to get them involved in what you're doing. Then, once you have that and you have a little bit of traction, you need to go out and start to talk about it and get things out there into material, go to trade shows, um, continue to talk about the products, and uh, at some point, it just it, it reaches some kind of um, critical mass where people have all of a sudden heard of you. And that happened for us maybe three, four months ago, you know, where we went from, oh, Agrable, who are they? To, oh, Agrable, we've heard of you. Tell us more about your products. You know, it takes a while. It takes a year or two to kind of pull that off. But at some point, there is a switch. And I, I can't really identify what, what causes that. I think you have to have a quality product that people really identify with. Um, and you have to invest enough in getting people out there and show excitement around your brand to build that brand. Um, the, other way, the other way to do that marketing is to try to sell your company up front. You know, you have an idea, you have a component, you have a piece that can work in, and rather trying to build that brand and public demand for it, you just convince someone at another company to buy you for a couple million bucks and turn that into something, right? So th there's a number of ways to do this. We're, we're going about it rather the harder way, you know, <laughs> of actually building a brand from nothing, building it into something. Um, but I think there's great opportunity in that, and it's, it's worth what we're doing. So, yeah. What other information does the Morning Farm Report give you besides weather? So um, it, of course, gives you the weather back. Um, but the key kind of pieces of information that come out of it, you've got um, an analysis of the weather. We have the tractor time piece that I showed that shows you whether or not you can drive in a field in a predictive sense. We have a sophisticated biophysical crop growth model that actually grows the crop. We do a soil water balance, looking at the rainfall in, the soil moisture out, the plant use of it, that nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium and micronutrient content within the soil and what's being used by the plant. We grow that plant every day. We're able to predict the yield for that plant, and then we're able to come in and look at, because we're growing that plant, when is it going to be stressed? When is it going to be challenged? What indicators are there for a pest or disease or issue with it? So we can then start to figure out the timings of those two, and we have a thing called pest engine. We have a drone report that lets you know whether you can fly a drone. Um, and ultimately, where this all ends is with a financial strategy of how do I sell my corn? How do I sell my soybean? Is the market change coming? Am I, am I in, a, in a position of advantage or disadvantage? And what do I do to correct that? That is the concept of hedging and a hedging strategy of how do I hedge my bets in the marketplace so that I'm not so exposed? Um, for those that, I, and I'm, I'm getting a rapid education in, uh, in the finances of, of agriculture, but um, that concept of taking out a loan for a million or a million and a half dollars and then just sticking it out into the, into the world and seeing what happens. That's, um, that's, that's a crazy, crazy notion. You are long in the marketplace. That's the language for that, right? And we're trying to figure out hedging strategies to take someone who's long in the marketplace and move them to properly hedged would be a condition where they're somewhat more adaptable to those changes.
then somebody who's right next door who, who does uh, take advantage. Is there any um, conflict between those sorts of folks where you're sharing there what they might consider their own proprietary information, having been a farmer for multiple years and they know how to run their land and then somebody else is profiting or uh, improving their position by that data? Yeah, so th that's, that's a great point. So one of, the, one of the big concerns out there in agriculture right now is that um, you're using my data to help my neighbors or that this, you're using my data somehow. We've, um, we've been very careful not to share grower data. So if, if you as a grower on your ground have put in information that's specific to you, we don't use that to benchmark you against your neighbor. It's just used for you. We have this philosophy that every year, Every field is an exception. It, it's never happened before, it'll never happen again. And that's, that's an essential kind of design element in what we do, in that when you're thinking of it and you frame it that way, our feeling is that the data and information that a grower tells us about their field is most useful to them in that field that year. And it's really not as useful to their neighbor or the guy down the street. We're, we're not using it in that way. I would prefer to have that person who's down the street Get, the, get their own information about their field and try to give them a better prediction, not use this guy's information to tell how this guy might be, might be behaving. And that's different for many in the marketplace. There are um, the thoughts around big data, and big data is just really rebadged statistics. You know, big data isn't anything. It's just making statistics sound sexier. You know, I don't know. <laughs> Statistics sounds kind of awful. Oh, statistics class, that's going to be terrible, you know. But big data class, I mean, I have thousands of people sign up for that, you know. Um, and it's the same exact thing. So when we think of some of these approaches that are statistical, they're trying to say, well, if I look at 60 fields around your field and I see that as now a population of potential, I can see where your field fits within that range of fields around you. That's a statistical big data approach. Our approach is actual biophysical crop growth model on that field and growing it up from nothing there. And we use big data in a different way to get the weather conditions right on that field as opposed to trying to just rely on the results from neighbors around. It gives us the advantage too of being able to predict what's happening. Where I'm using a statistic, I have to rely on what already happened. I could only tell you about your field relative to your neighbor's fields from last year. I couldn't tell you about this year because it hasn't happened yet. So in terms of risk uh, for the farmer, where there's a lot of risk involved, and always has been, and the increasing sort of uh, presence of hybrid seed providers, is there an additional risk that the hybrid seed provider can have this yield potential information and then begin to leverage what the price will be for the farmer so that they're maximizing on their end, you know what I mean? So oh yeah, there's absolutely that potential. And I, I believe, you know, that's one of the differences with Agribulls. We, we are selling the analytics just for analytics sake. We don't have another product that we bundle up. So we sell these, it's a subscription-based service. So we're selling the concepts and the intellectual property around the modeling. Other companies are actually also selling the seed or also selling the fertilizer. And I think truly you have to take that with a grain of salt, you know, is that, really the best possible answer, or is it the answer that helps them sell the other product that they're selling with it? And that, that's a decision for everybody to know. I, I, I think back to just the, the human example of, I go, to, I go to Meyer and I use the little Mperks card that my wife has and um, coupons shoot out for milk because I buy a lot of milk. You know, is that a bad thing? Well, it might not be the milk I wanna buy, but it's a deal on milk. Am I, am I giving up something by letting that happen, by giving that information to them. I get coupons, it might not be what I want, but I think I'm smart enough to realize, well, thanks, I guess you figured out that I'm buying a lot of milk. I don't wanna buy that milk anyway. I'm smart enough to say I wanna buy the milk I wanna buy. Um, I think the growers are in that same position, you know, and it's, it's really up to that grower then to decide, well, yeah, they're telling me to buy that milk. I don't know, I, I've gotta buy seed whether I buy their seed or I use an independent calculator to figure out what really would perform the best on my property in this year, that's, that's I think, the decision for an informed grower. 